Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the series of webinars of the Cordillera Textiles Project. We are pleased to have our guest for today, uh, Tim Manalo, is now based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, meantime, we'd like to invite you to our uh, Cordillera Textiles Project or Corditex website. It features the activities and projects of the Corditex. This is an interdisciplinary team of uh, researchers uh, and faculty who's doing work on uh, textiles. And we also have, if you missed our uh, series of webinars, uh, they are now uploaded online. Uh, you can also uh, go to the link and listen to previous webinars. We have guests from, uh, from textile conservators. Uh, we have uh, textile weavers and artisans, as well as cultural bearers who talked about um, uh, their own textile. So we now have our uh, guest for today, Timothy uh, Manalo, and we'll introduce him shortly after uh, this brief introduction about the Corditex website. And we also have uh, research and other publications. Uh, we have here uh, the journal articles, the books of Corditex, and others now included in our website. We also have a Facebook page of um, the Corditex, and uh, you can see the updates here and other activities activities of the Cordillera Textile Project. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, introduce to you our resource person for today. His name is Timothy Manalo. He is a sculpture and installation artist, born and raised in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. In 2010, he graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from OCAD University, majoring in sculpture and installation, installation, and was awarded the medal for his program. Following his undergraduate studies, he worked extensively in the fabrication industry as a studio assistant and an in-house sculptor for various companies specializing in art and design fabrication. In 2019, he completed a Master of Fine Arts in Studio Art from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Tufts University in Boston with a certificate in museum studies. Tim also exhibited in galleries in Canada and the United States that include the Canadian Sculpture Center in Toronto and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, and was an art artist in residence at the Franconia Sculpture Park in Sheffer, Minnesota. He also received grants from the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Council for the Arts. Currently, Tim is a recipient of the 2023-2024 Laser Rick Fiber Arts Residency Award at the Contemporary Textile Studio and Co-op in Toronto, Canada as well as a researcher at the after school with the Center for Arts, Design, and Social Research. He is also preparing for an upcoming residency at the International Studio and Curatorial Program in Brooklyn, New York. I know it's 10 o'clock um, in the <laughs> evening now, so we apologize for the time uh, for Tim to be with us this morning. So uh, without further ado, Adu, we would like to welcome Tim for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Manang Ikin. How are you? <laughs> good evening and good morning here. Yes, good morning. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be a part of the Cordy Tech series. I feel like it's such an important series of talks around Philippine textiles that I wish I had available to me earlier in my art practice, but it's here now and I'm very happy to be a part of it. Um, so I guess I have to share my my screen, right? Um, 
How do I do that? Am I able to do that? Yes. Uh, just click share screen and then you can. Oh, right there. Sorry. It's been a while. Uh, I'm usually just a participant in in Zoom talks. Um, so I will go to share screen from start. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So weaving as practice, art and innovation, as um Manang Ikin explained, uh, my background is in sculpture and uh, but I have been doing a lot of textile work as well in my practice. Um, so I wanted to, oh shoot. So I wanted to start with kind of giving a overview of the kind of sort of like the the outline of what I would present. So I'll start off with like my sculpture practice and then talk about community arts and then get into my textile practice. And then I'll talk about the fiber arts residency and then talk about the new works, new projects that I've been doing uh, through the fiber arts residency, the Lisa Rich fiber arts residency. Um, so body and machine, I think like, talking about weaving and working on the loom, um, I kind of wanted to sort of trace it back to my my practice um, in, in sculpture and kind of like where I started. I studied sculpture and installation and um, there's sort of like some parts of, uh, I guess like my, my sculpture practice and my uh, weaving, weaving practice that kind of like interconnects in some way, which you might notice like through the slideshow and as I go through my body of works. Um, yeah, so I guess like with the loom, it's just so physically involved. And so in a way it sort of relates to the body. And so these ideas around the body have been very prevalent in my art practice. And um, because I, I mean, yeah, I studied sculpture and I was really drawn to um, uh, really traditional processes of of mold making, like and like casting and working with plaster materials, silicone, and really like the traditional uh, approaches to sculpture. Um, I would make molds of sort of found objects or like sculptures that I would actually sculpt, like this hand. Um, and oh. so these are just examples of works that I did um, as in in my in my in my art practice. Um, some are more recent, some are very old, like from ten years ago. But you see, there's sort of um, connections to the body. This is examples of molds that I've made. Again, like food uh, related to the body. Um, I'm trying to really like make this connection or try to show this connection of of weaving being like this very physical like body and machine um, practice in relation to the kind of like uh, uh, subject matter that was existing in that exists in my sculpture sculpture work. Um, so weaving to connect. Uh, this is a part of my uh, a part of my sort of like my journey in in textiles and in weaving. Um, so when I finished school, I, which was like around 2010, I was trying to find uh, local opportunities. And I was working again, like in the fabrication industry, as mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, as like a studio assistant, as an in-house sculptor, um, but there was sort of like other ambitions or interests that I had. And aside from like these, um, the day jobs that I had, I kind of wanted to get more involved with other sectors of the art world. And so going, being involved in community arts programs and specifically finding ones that were um, like, Filipino, there was there was a lot that I didn't know about that um, was happening in Toronto and these arts and cultural organizations that were um, nonprofit 
and were also catered to to youth to um as it called like underserved youth and um that were all local and it I mean I was really trying to like after school after my undergraduate studies I was really trying to find opportunities for me to just be able to make more art to be able to just be in the studio and produce and exhibit some more and to even teach and so I found that through community arts programs in Toronto um I also have it listed here in this slideshow in this slide of collaborations and commissions that I also did to help me continue practice weaving um I forgot to mention too that you know, I went to school for sculpture and installation, but what really sparked my interest in textiles was a intro course that I took that was like an elective. Um, I feel like it really jumped, jumped. Uh, so to, to give context to um, my, my journey in weaving, it really started from a course that I took when I was in, in undergrad, when I was in school. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And it was a lot of different things, but that we learned related to fiber arts, but um, weaving was really the most like interesting to me. It was the most exciting. Um, and it was this process. And I think again, like relating it to the subject matter that was already really existing in my sculpture practice, especially even, even at that time, um, you know, the body and the object, things like that, that weaving on a loom, just the activity of it felt like it, I resonated a lot with it. Um, so anyway, moving forward, I, so I found a lot of different arts organizations and actually it was through these, um, through the events of these organizations, um, like these Filipino cultural arts organizations in in Toronto, I actually met Manang Ikin through that because she was doing a talk and was hosted by um, like the Kapo Collective, like one of those organizations that I'm talking about, those collectives. I also met like other Filipino weavers too. This is this is Cassandra Hernandez from um, Crossing Threads. She's based in Australia, but she I think she reached out to me when she was visiting or when she was like there in Toronto working temporarily. And that that like like kind of connecting with um, that community or connecting with other Filipinos, I felt like, um, and also just learning about the deeply rooted traditions of of weaving. I mean, I was already really interested in weaving, and so learning that there's this long tradition of it. It's like it's part of the sort of like the material culture of the Philippines in the Philippines, I felt so much more purposeful about weaving, about working with textiles and being an artist. So when I met other weavers or other, um, other artists who were working in similar medium and, and yeah, we're Filipino, I just kind of felt so connected and um, I was weaving to connect. Um, and then I continued to like work on my weaving skills and it was through other artist friends who I knew that weren't all Filipino, but they wanted to collaborate. It was very rare, I think at that time, this was around like 2012 that you that I that I mean I think for me that I met a lot of that I would even meet other weavers I mean I think now I mean you know you can argue with me on that but I think now there's not there's still not a lot of weavers that I meet or people who work um like on looms that know how to work uh or use a loom um and so I think like this, the fact that I had that skill set and that I was also developing it, um, it attracted other artists or other designers to want to collaborate with me. Um, so these are just some projects that I did, um, you know, trying out different, um, different designs and different patterns, just 
really experimenting with um, things that I always wanted to try and kind of also work with different materials as well. Uh, and just really continue to build on my weaving skills. Um, I didn't really, you know, I was still very much like involved with like my, my art practice, like when I was exhibiting work, it was primarily sculpture. It was primarily a lot of mold making. And so weaving, I didn't really know how to incorporate it into my sculpture and installation practice, but collaborating with other people and doing a lot of this community work, um, community arts work really helped me kind of uh, like develop it some more. Um, and of course, like I was following trends as well. Like again, at that time, like 2012-ish, there was, um, or 2012, 20, like 14 or something, uh, like wall hangings, like small wall hangings were like really hot. And um, you would see them a lot in like boutique stores. I mean, especially in Toronto. So that's an exotic plains. This is an art installation that I did that really combined um, the textiles with my mold making. Uh, so I, so I, again, like going back to meeting other Filipino weavers, one of my really good friends who I met, um, uh, Cynthia Alberto, she runs or ran actually uh, Weaving Hand, which was a weaving studio in Brooklyn, New York. And I actually met her um, just through me like posting photos or like in process uh, images of like weaving projects that I did. And we just sort of like connected through social media. And then she came to visit and she invited me to um, show work in her space, which was part studio part, like there was a gallery wall too. And at that time she was also running a residency. I didn't do the residency, but I was able to show in their gallery space. Um, and so I created this work that really tried to combine um, these two aspects of my, my art practice, which was sculpture and weaving. Um, especially because it was for weaving hand, like weaving studio. Um, so I I created this, I mean, I can't really remember what it was so much about. I mean, it was a lot of different things. It was a lot of like deep, deep thinking and then kind of like going through the process of making it and then um, sort of like this research that I did not really being that visible in the work. But essentially it was, um, a, it was really just like an exploration on like the 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 materials of of textile being really soft and like plaster uh being really hard and um sort of like creating a kind of like dynamic of of like a wall work and evoking like curtains like the form and the material kind of like played with each other in that way um yeah and i and i tried um dyeing with like commercial dyes and just really wanted to do something really multicolored. Um, and then this is me carving this uh, curtain um, pattern that was, oh, it's not pattern, sorry, this curtain sculpture or like this sort of like draped textured like um, flat wall piece carved out of foam and then I, I finished with a uh, um, with what do you call it, with like spackle and then I sanded it down. And then I made a mold, a rubber mold, and then I casted the whole thing. And then I I broke it up into different pieces um, because I really wanted it to like spread out along the wall. Um, and then, yeah, there you go. I, I glued it onto these plaster forms, like on some of them and the, the others I just left bare. So experimental approaches. This is the era of my practice where I really started to think more about the symbolism of the materials I was using. I mean, um, going back to my sculpture practice and mold making, there's so much room to play with or sort of like create your own narratives through the form, like the form of the object combined with the casting material. like. 
there is a kind of like language um, or sort of like a symbolism. There's a lot of meaning in, in objects and then there's a lot of meaning in what the object is made of. And when they kind of like uh, clash or challenge each other or disrupt each other in a way, it creates these really interesting uh, or uh, new narratives of in the work. And I wanted to try and do that with with weaving, with textiles. And I really tried to explore different or research and explore different ways of like, of like each, every material has, like every fiber has its own sort of like um, meaning to it. And so I kind of did that through a series of different works that I created throughout the years. Um, so this work, Imperial Floods, um, it's, it was a piece that I did like thinking a lot about like history and kind of drawing back to like Filipino Philippine history. And so I used a uh, manila rope and um, a, a manila rope being sort of like the primary uh, material of this work. And um, I, I just went ahead and just like wove with it. Um, again, not really thinking about like the final form, like how the final installation would, would look, but more so just working with the material, weaving the way that I felt like felt right. And um, and then over time, like the, the final vision uh, began to materialize. Um, so this is just an image of me setting up the loom I mean, to speak in like more technical terms, like this is a sectional warp beam. Um, this is the loom that I uh, use usually, uh, 36 inches wide. And um, I made this bobbin uh, rack myself. Um, and I just like attach the bobbins on and then I tie it to uh, uh, eyelet hooks. And then I, it's just easier when I put eyelet hooks as opposed to like directly. But anyway, that's like technical stuff. Um, just a close up of the manila rope in the bamboo. Um, yeah, so this is bamboo warp that I used. Uh, and I mean, I was thinking very literally like manila rope, bamboo. And then I also bleached it too. I mean, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm calling back to manila rope and its sort of history and its history as like, uh, material used really prevalent in the Manila Spanish galleon trade. And I mean, like, yeah, like, you know, Manila rope, bamboo, bleach. Yeah. So I use bleach to, to kind of like transform the texture. Um, and yeah. And so this is sort of like the, the effect that uh, came from it. Um, I just sort of, I just dipped like the bottom part of it um, to sort of like, okay, also at the time there was many floods happening in the Philippines as there's always floods. And it just kind of felt like, like, you know, there's this sort of like metaphor I feel like was was happening with like the Manila Row, colonization, bleach, you know, it was, it was, it was a very sort of like literal, um, you know, approach that I was doing like really looking at the at the connotations and the meaning um, from from these these three different things, uh, but I think in in the process, as I was saying, like just kind of letting myself make, there were really interesting like like textures and colors that emerged out of that um, sort of like material exploration uh, in this work. So Medrinyaki, I did this piece when I was in grad school. Um, I went to, as mentioned, uh, to the School of the Muse Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts in the US. Um, and I didn't, I did that, I was there between um, 2017 to 2019. And I didn't really do a lot of, uh, textile work or like woven projects or weaving projects, um, I should say. 
it, I think like in grad school, I was really much more interested in like the research aspect and um, trying to think or be more um, research focused in the work that I was making. I felt like I had a lot of um, skills already in the studio. I mean, I, I felt like there was already a lot of uh, fabrication skills that I did. I mean, prior to this, I was already working in these studios and I was also just like practicing on my own. Um, and so, I mean, I did make, I did make work, don't get me wrong, but um, with this piece in particular, uh, I did a lot of, I was really investing in a lot of research as I was creating. Um, and medrinyake, I mean, it's, it's a term that was really common in, uh, during the global textile trade in the 1600s, 1800s. And I know that it's been used um, in past Cordytex talks as well. But when I was researching it, and when I was, I mean, when I was in grad school, I should also mention, I was also really researching a lot of on Philippine textiles. Um, and when I encountered that term, uh, I always understood it as like a negative thing because in the world of, of in the global textile market during that time, there was so much like materials that were uh, more of the luxury tier. And then there were others that were at the bottom. And because um, Abaca was, uh, very rough and not of the soft, uh, silky quality. Um, I always thought that there was a negative connotation to it. So from that, I began to um, look at materials now that also kind of have negative connotations that I could weave with. And so I thought of like plastic materials that um, you would find in Chinatown, like the polypropylene twine. Um, and also just like at that time as well, I was really invested in, in research related to um, uh, migrant and diasporic aesthetics. And so Chinatown was like, especially when I was studying, it was like this really special place for me to, to kind of like go back to um, those like, you know, immigrant, immigrant upbringing, that immigrant upbringing uh, that I that I had. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it's modeled after a banig. Because I was also playing with this idea of, of how to present textiles and to shift the way um, people can appreciate them, kind of like see them see the value in textiles that exist in sort of like our mundane ex everyday experiences and um, find like uh, more value and meaning in it. And so I was, I was also exploring a lot of um, different ways of display uh, that isn't always like on a pedestal or mounted on the wall, but rather like on the floor. And I think like also just kind of referring back to my, my culture, my Filipino culture, like those Filipino parties that I grew up with um, is something that I referred to, um, I, I often referred to in, in the work that I was making. Um, so, so yeah, um, just the idea of these sort of like materials and these forms that um, have these kind of negative connotations, I wanted to like, you know, I was referring to them and wanting to make art based on that. Um, this is a shot of just how I was making it. I made a small like square frame loom with nails and um, it was just like plain woven. And then um, I had a template that I would lay on and then I would like sort of embroider those patterns into it like that, um, like a smaller, like thinner threads. Um, uh, so this is the final install shot from my MFA thesis. Um, I made plaster casts of fast food items. Again, like playing with this idea of like things that are often considered 
negative, like, um, like being on the floor, sitting on the floor, eating on the floor, eating with your hands. So that was how I kind of put that together in my thesis project, my thesis work. Um, this is, this was something that I started doing after I finished school. I continued to, I was living in Boston still um, because after I graduated in 2019, I was doing a teaching fellowship. And part of that allowed me to continue to work in the studio that I was in. Um, I was doing this teaching fellowship for about a year. And um, this is actually something that I started working on while I was still a student. But again, I didn't have a lot of textile or fiber arts pieces that I was working on during grad school because I was just trying to like work more slowly. I mean, not too slowly, but I was thinking about the symbolism of the materials. And seasonal fish was this blanket that I wanted to make made out of different woven parts. Um, and I was thinking more about um, the tactile or like the sensorial experience of, of textiles and how to uh, show that in, in my work, um, how to show that in, in the textile works and woven works that I was making. Um, so again, like thinking about the meaning of the materials in fiber, like every fiber that you use, um, maybe not every fiber, but the natural fibers, they um, have, a, they each have like specific qualities to them. Like some are that qualities that are meant for the body to help the body sort of like acclimatize to any sort of environment that it's in or any kind of condition that it's in. I mean, like there's uh, like wools that are very insulating. There are some wools that are much more insulating than others. Um, bamboo is antibacterial. Um, what else is there? Like silk, I think silk. Cotton definitely is like cooling. Like there's these different qualities of these materials that, oh, and also like alpaca is like very, it wicks. Um, it's a wicking like fiber. And so I kind of wanted to make this blanket that uh, had every bit of those fibers in it, uh, every bit of those yarns and um, that could be like the survival blanket um, that in any condition you're in, you would live um, and survive. Um, and yeah, I, I also wanted to get more of like some interesting textures out of it. And so I, I machine washed it <laughs> like thinking, oh, this is gonna be a great idea. But, and I guess I, I liked the textures, but it was also, um, it was so varied. I mean, like when you have like wool, especially and you wash it, it's going to shrink. So I guess I didn't really think too much about that. Um, and I just went ahead and did it, but I still pursued uh, realizing it in the form of this blanket. Um, so I also, um, what do I, what is it called? Like I used satin as a lining and then I also included like um, batting too and I sewed it. And I also uh, used like leftover yarns um, from all the yarns that I used to make this blanket as like a uh, trim fringe um, and that it, the idea is that it could be worn and hugged. It's actually quite heavy too. So even when you like wear it as a blanket or like sort of put it on yourself, it's pretty weighted. Um, so Maha Blanca, this is a project that I started doing during the pandemic and it's actually made of dog fur, spun dog fur. So I started spinning it um, when I, here are all the heart reactions. Uh, so this is my parents' dog. And so when I, um, when I, when the pandemic happened, I was living in Boston and, um, that whole experience, that whole like sort of career trajectory that I had of like doing this teaching fellowship, um, brought me back to Toronto. And so I was living with my parents. And during that time when uh, the restrictions were very strict and um, I, yeah, I, 
I have, so my parents have a Samoyed and so she like is of like the, the Siberian Husky family and she blows her coat like I think once or twice every year. And since then, like every time I comb her, um, I've always been collecting her fur. I think as an artist, just like you have this tendency of like hoarding things, not really knowing what you're gonna do with it. And so I was doing that, um, thinking, oh, I'm gonna make art out of it. I don't know what, but um, I'm sure I'll do it. And I already was aware of like felting with dog fur and also aware of like the traditions of like Samoids, uh, Samoid fur being very insulating and used for, you know, making, making weavings, making blankets and textiles. So now was my chance to spin myself. Um, it was just a, a sh very short video of me spinning on a drop spindle, a Turkish drop spindle. Um, yeah, and and that's just kind of what um, what I was doing for for a very long time. It took a very long time to spin all of it, to wash it, to spin it, and this is the warp that I set up on the on the loom. I set up I again during the pandemic I set up a loom in my parents' basement, and so I would weave on that um, as we were all like staying at home. Um, so I did sort of like a ECAT, uh, technique. Um, I wound up linen yarns, um, and I, uh, I wound them into balls and then I tied them from the inside, um, and then just threw it in a vat of commercial dye and just let, let the effect, uh, happen. This is like something that I wanted to mention that I was referencing from um, in a bell. Like I got this book when I was in the Philippines, like back in, I think 2016. Um, it's funny because like at that time, that's when, when I first started weaving, there was like rarely any books that had anything about Philippine textiles. And I was always like on the hunt for like learning more about its history and its knowledge. And, um, and suddenly there's all of these books that are out. And um, and so, yeah, I found this and going through it, I was really drawn to this Ecat rain effect that I, I liked because it was, because the, the way you would do it just seemed so, um, it was easy for you to just fall into the process. There was no precise design that you had to follow. It was just, you know, you tie the stuff, at least for me, that's kind of like how I saw it. You just tie the warp and then you dip it in, in the vat and that's it. And, um, and then what comes out is really random and that's sort of the whole point, but there's still a very dynamic effect to it um, like this. So I really like that. And I really wanted to include that into the Maha Blanca blanket project that I was doing. Um, but yeah, this took me a long time to do, I should mention. I mean, I started during the pandemic, but in 2020, and then it was on and off that I was working on it. I think most of the time since then, it was just like spinning uh, Maha's yarn, uh, sorry, Maha's fur into yarn. Um, okay, so here we are. The, I guess the climax of this talk. Um, the Lisa Rich Fiber Arts Residency Award is an award that was founded by Lisa Rich, who's a textile artist who's currently uh, residing in, um, I mean, if you're familiar with Canadian geography, just outside of Kingston, Ontario. Um, so she's a Canadian based textile artist, or sorry, fiber artist. Um, and she makes incredible work. Um, and she started this residency program with Ontario Arts Council, oh, sorry, uh, Craft Ontario, not Ontario Arts Council, Craft Ontario, um, a um, Ontario-based uh, craft arts organization. Um, and so together they started this residency at the Contemporary Textile Studio and Cooperative in Toronto. Um, and this is its first year, so I'm, one of the first recipients, 
one of three. Uh, and so, yeah, it's been really, really, really amazing um, being a part of the Contemporary Textile Studio and um, going there and to work has been so, um, has really been helping my textile practice like grow and develop. Um, I wanted to use this residency opportunity to um, start new works that I kind of ideas that I had sort of like brewing in my head for a while and also try to finish ones that have that I've already started and that have been sitting on the shelf. Um, so some of these projects I, I narrowed down, um, natural dyeing, and then also like Madriniake part two, indigo and working with human hair. Um, so the contemporary textile studio is based in a, like a sort of building, <laughs> sort of building, a building in uh, the downtown Toronto core. And the building houses a lot of different arts organizations um, and artists studios. Um, and you can see shops and bookstores um, and galleries as well. Um, very vibrant, vibrant place. Uh, and it, yeah, and this is the studio. This is um, what it looks like, a big table. Um, and yeah, so one of the things that the Contemporary Textile Studio, so I should also mention too that the Textile Studio, it's, it operates as a cooperative, as it is in its name. Um, so there's a small group of members that are also artists, uh, textile artists and designers with like really incredible, extensive background and experiences um, and skills, like very, very skilled people. Um, they're like, yeah, just very, very skilled. And um, I was gonna say that they're, I'm just gonna say it, they're like the Avengers Infinity War of like textile and fiber artists in Toronto, I would say. They're really amazing. But one of the things that they are really, really uh, masterful at, they're, masterful at many things um, is natural dyeing. Um, and so I've been really like giving in to a lot of the, the, the kind of like skills that I could learn from them. Um, they're super, I get mentioned like experience and they've had years of research. And so there's like so much that I'm trying to get um, and learn. And so these are the things that I've been focused on I mean, food and food waste um, and mud dyeing. So like in terms of natural dyeing, I'm leaning a lot towards um, using kind of like going through this approach to learn more from sort of like my surroundings and uh, the land. And so uh, working with like food waste that I think are kind of, uh, prevalent to my everyday experience and uh, mud dyeing, which is like forging uh, from, like forging wild clay. Um, I was already, so speaking of mud dyeing, I was already really, I was already exploring that um, like uh, the year before or for a while from past residencies that I was, that I was doing, um, I was really trying to get into ceramics. I mean, like trying to like learn some ceramic skills that I can incorporate into my sculpture mold making practice. And um, I was really interested in in clay foraging. And um, I, I, again, like I, I felt like it was something that was important for me to do to really think about like how I can learn from my, my surroundings and how I can learn from the land just through this process. Um, so I did a residency in Spain. Uh, this is, Porte Concepcion is um, in the, the Iberian Peninsula area part of, of Spain. So it's like close to Portugal. And this residency was in like the rural part and lots of nature and lots of clay. So um, I foraged wild clay um, when I was there and I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. I mean, I didn't have access to a kiln, so 
I couldn't really make any samples or like, you know, explore this material. So I just brought it back to Toronto, um, thinking that I could fire there. Um, yeah. And because of the Lisa Rich residency opportunity, and because there was so much that I could learn in terms of natural dyeing from that and from the members, I I can't remember how I learned about this, but um, mud dyeing is a thing that I that I that I realized I could dye with. Like you know, there's earth pigments, so of course I could use clay. And also, I learned this recently that mud dyeing is really is is commonly used in Philippine textiles. Actually, um, I think I learned like in my research I learned that it was really common in in uh, textiles from the south. So. Anyway, I, the clay has to be iron rich. It's really the iron that gives it that tint. And I wasn't sure if there was iron in it. I just assumed that there was because the cotton canvas bag sack that I, that I uh, had the clay in, which was sitting in there for a long time, um, it, it colored. So it was, it was like brown. So I thought, okay, I could just dye with this, um, mud dye with it. So um, some of the members, uh, I learned from the members sort of like techniques and um, also did some like online searches on ways of dyeing, mud dyeing. And what's key is protein. So to prepare or to mordant the fibers, you need to soak it in uh, protein. And so apparently soy milk was really the most common uh, mordant to use when it came to mud dyeing. Um, so yeah, I just I just bought a carton from the from like the grocery store of of what was labeled as high protein soy milk, um, and hoped for the best. I think um, yeah, ideally you want to use fresh soybeans and make your own soy milk. But I thought, I'll get away with it. <laughs> I'll just, I mean, this was all an experiment and all an exploration in, in natural dyeing, specifically mud dyeing. So I thought I'd try it. Um, so again, I, tr I wanted to do the, the rain uh, ECAT design technique in this. Um, when I was doing my residency, I did it in November, 2022. And uh, the year before that, there was, this severe drought in in Spain, like especially along the Iberian Peninsula in that area. So I thought it made sense to go for like a rain design. Um, yeah. And then this is me taking, you know, I left it in this vat of like wet clay. Um, it actually really smelled badly when I, when I rehydrated the clay. Um, so that was a bit of a problem, something I didn't expect, but nonetheless, I went ahead with it. Um, and then this is me untying it. So I washed it, I rinsed it, and um, I, yeah, I took out the, the, the ties. And seeing it wet, it, it's a bit more visible, but you know, next to it in the photo, it's not as visible as like a dry, as dry as a dry skein or dry, um, dry yarn. <laughs> so, um, I should also mention too that I used um linen. So this is linen. I think I actually have that written in one of the slides, but um, this was the effects of linen. So it it varies with different materials, and um, I was much more successful with cotton actually. So I also had cotton yarn that I wound into bobbins. And then I also dipped that in soy milk. And um, also gonna talk. Oops. Um, and I, yeah, I dipped that in soy milk. I, I dipped that in soy milk and then I tossed it into the, the same clay vat. Um, and this is the, the final result. Um, I think it was much more successful and cotton was like better for me at least. Um, 
and then I also like I like I talked about I also did um I boiled uh annatto seeds and um I died with that and then I also um like dyed uh onion skins I I mean just using like really household like household uh, uh foods or food waste um and this is the result so the onion skin and the annatto it had really vibrant colors and actually I used the yarns for this was um a it's called cotton lin cotton cotton it's cotton and linen blend um so this is me setting it up on the on the loom um and then this is me weaving um the warp is uh just undyed untreated cotton and then um the stripe across is onion skin um and then i don't know i guess you could see I don't know if you can see the 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 mud dye in the linen like the warp but um I took a photo and I keep looking at it and thinking okay maybe it's there um so very quickly Medrnyake 2 is a continuation of the ideas that I was exploring from the first uh project like I also wanted to weave another baneg I wanted to use manila rope kind of you know sticking to the the actual meaning of Medrinyake as like really rough um, and textured. I wanted to make it darker. So I uh, dyed it in black walnut, which was just kind of sitting around in the studio and uh, just needed some, I guess, reviving or some one to use it. And so I, I threw untied manila rope into, untwisted manila rope that I untwisted and uh, tossed it in in this vat of um, walnut. So I still also work at my parents. It was like when I visit my parents, um, I would go to the basement where I set up the loom back when it was the pandemic. And I would also weave there. So I've been weaving that in this. I think like, so I wanted to use like more earthy colors, like uh, brown uh, polypropylene twine and also like the darker uh, manila rope. And then this is supposed to be, the strip down here is supposed to be like a gray, but um, I guess like it looks a bit blue. Um, yeah. Okay, very quickly. Indigo, um, I'm learning indigo. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting process for me. I think that like there's all of these sort of like, um, like macrocosmic and microcosmic uh, like elements in the process of dyeing with indigo that I never really thought of. Like when I started weaving, there was, it, like it was so trendy. Like, and you saw in the wall hangings that I did, those were indigo dyed through like a collaborative project that I was working, that I that I did. And um, I never actually dyed with indigo except for through like more commercial means, like some packet that you would buy. But the actual process of having like all the different chemical ingredients and it's, and like, you know, adjusting the temperature, heating it up, um, and and just the the whole process being really interesting, kind of how uh, it it turns, it's green in the vat, and then when it's exposed to oxygen, um, it that's when it becomes blue. So this is something that I was really interested in. It's a project that I'm starting, just really like letting myself like fall into the process of, of indigo dyeing. Um, and this is wool, by the way. Um, I don't really have like a fully fleshed out idea of a project that I would use this for. I mean, I have some, but um, yeah, this is, again, I'm using this residency as an opportunity to start new, new things. So this is one piece that I started working on before I came to the residency. Um, I'm weaving with human hair and Human hair has been used quite often in in uh, textiles and in weavings as like as like a piece of art as I've com as I've seen um, commonly like you know used to represent like um, like 
uh, life and death, like the memento mori or like the passing of time. And I made this weaving that was inspired by human hair. Um, I had a lot of black uh, yarns in my stock of, of yarns that I've collected over the years, that I've acquired over the years. And I wanted to make this weaving like a sort of like blanket that was made of, that ha that was inspired by hair and also has hair in it too, as you'll see later in the slides. Um, I, again, like I was working with the blanket form. So I wanted to make this blanket. And again, like it's it's a mix of different black yarns. I mean, you see that brown strip. This is, this was labeled as like dark wool. So I didn't realize that it was more brown up against like the other black yarns, but I still incorporated it into this piece. Um, but I also wanted some brown in, in the weaving. These are again, like leftover yarns, similar to what I did with seasonal fish, that other, the white blanket um, to look like hair, but then actually using hair. So um, I use Filipino hair to be exact. Um, that is, you know, you can buy online. Um, it's really common to find uh, human hair that's very like, I guess like race specific. Um, and I kind of came across this a while ago and I was so, I felt like, it felt really weird kind of seeing that, but also that reaction made me want to learn more. And I think also as an artist, my natural instinct when it comes to, I mean, maybe not all the time, but I, I think this one specifically, I thought with like, with hair being used in weavings in the past, in textiles in the past, um, the fact that it was like very specific, I thought that there would be some sort of interesting narrative that would come from working with this material. Um, and I also learned that there's very specific qualities to it that make it very desired as, uh, as extensions or as a wig. Um, so that was also very interesting. Um, yeah, so I continued to work with it and incorporate it into this woven piece and this is the image that's on the, the poster. Um, and this is the final um, work, maybe not final, but I'm still kind of working on it. But this is, this was the weaving and this is where the, this is the, this is what has the hair in it. Um, and this is how I kind of have imagined it being installed. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my, of my artist talk. Thanks for listening. Hi, Tim. Hi. <laughs> wow. I was, I thought there's more. So I'm, uh, oh, is it? Really I tried to, <laughs> I tried to make sure that, um, I, uh, was in within the time frame. Yeah. Is that okay? Did I go over? I didn't want to go over. It's over, but it's fine. Yeah. Okay. How fascinating is your work. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, yeah, I, you have, uh, I, I appreciate the research that goes into your work. Uh, so that's one. And also the exploration and use of different materials on uh, your work also. No? So that's fascinating. Um, meantime, um, uh, we are going to entertain some questions from our participants and also I have some um, some questions here as well. Okay, so, I'm ready. <laughs> right. Uh, so this uh, a question here. Uh, well, anonymous. Uh, she said that what a beautiful artwork, Timothy. When you look at your piece using the Manila rope, it has the ombre effect, and the colors remind me of clothes uh, soaked in flood water waters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a comment from uh, Gay, uh, Eiko Jalsita, also one of our textile scholars. Uh, he, her comment is, uh, good that you use the fur of your parents' dog to spin fiber. How is the wash and wear using ma Maha's fair? fur? No? Do you hand wash it or can it be washed on a gentle cycle in a washing machine? 
things and that makes a very interesting textile. <laughs> I uh I tried washing it first, um, and machine washing it very gently, and then um and then I just uh what do you call it like a uh, hung dry it like I air dried it, um yeah even when I washed it there was a lot of fur that was coming off it was it was very loose and actually it's it's interesting that you brought that up because I mean in the photos you can see that it's very fluffy and um when I wove when I spun it and I wove with it it um you know it 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 felt like Maha. It felt like petting her. But then when I washed it and it became fluffy, it really feels like when I touch it, it's like I'm actually petting her. So um, I don't know. I decided I just wanted to mention that. But to answer your question, yeah, I I washed it in the in the machine, the washing machine. But I think next time I would wash it by hand. But I also I would try to avoid having to wash it. So it's not something that I that I use, um, it's, I kind of use it more as like a, you know, the equivalent of maybe like if you were to um, get an imprint of your dog's per, uh, paw on like a ceramic, like kind of like that, like in, you know, as a, like a, a sort of everlasting object that represents a uh, maha, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you, Manang Igin, you're on mute. Sorry. We also uh, saw some um, uh, weaving no, made of hair in Europe no, and also mm. they it as a uh, part of embroidery on textiles, as part of their embellishment. So that's really fascinating. Okay, so, um, well, just to add it to uh, Gay's comment, uh, your hair, uh, your human hair series are very innovative and very exciting. Now that's a um, additional comment. Oh, okay. thank you. So uh, let's see one more. Uh, thank you, Tim. That was such a great and comprehensive talk about your work and journey into materials. Is uh, material sustainability something that you think of in your work? Yeah, actually, I think about that a lot. And um I think it was really when I was in Spain. This was my first time going to Europe, um, really going abroad. Like I did residencies before, but it was closer, like in the U.S. And um, I, I thought of like how how much of a barrier it was, or how inconvenient it was for me to be able to make work in a place where it was it was hard and inconvenient for me to like bring materials or to buy materials that I usually work with. And I was already doing this um, uh, foraging exploration or experimentation in my practice. And I think like that also just made me think more about um, sustainability and thinking more like um, being more environmentally conscious around what I make and the impact that it has. I think also because when I was there, there was also just so much happening like that um, that Europe was facing at that time, 2022, um, that uh, November, 2022, when I was there, that um, really made me think about, well, what, what, am, what am I making? What am I doing this for? Um, you know, all of these like really deep questions and, um, and the world is changing. It was really like a, like a very existential at that time. And that really transformed into like how to be more thoughtful about the materials that I use. And I think that this residency at the textile, set, uh, the textile um, studio um, has really been helping me because again, like a lot of the members are so knowledgeable and are so experienced. And these are things that they've been thinking about for like many years already. And I'm just starting to enter this, this thought process and try to um, incorporate that into my work, thinking sustainably. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, that's a related uh, question like, uh, uh, for instance, um, recycling and upcycling uh, used yeah. clothing as well, no? So uh, we have a lot in the Philippines. Anyway, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, we have a comment from Lynn Milgram. Hi. Oh my gosh. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> so uh, she said, thank you, Timothy, for an interesting personalist personalized talk and for Cordy Techs for organizing this series of webinars. Thank you, Lynn, from Toronto, Canada. Thanks, Thank Lynn. You. Uh, there's <laughs> another question here um, from anonymous attendee. What an interesting and, and inspiring talk, knowing the processes, uh, your choice of materials, the meanings behind them, and the outputs you've made are all amazing. I totally agree. Are you planning to have an online exhibition sometime in the future? If yes, how can we see your future exhibits? Or maybe you have a website uh, that you can probably share with our participants. Yeah, I have a website. Um, it's uh, www.timothymanalo.com. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, yeah, it's very accessible. I mean, I'm also on social media, so you can find it there too. Um, yeah, you could just Google me uh, and find find stuff, um, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I have a website. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I have some more questions, uh, Timothy. Uh, yeah. I wanted to know, uh, uh, because you said that you have conducted research, no, maybe in the archives or in uh, some literature uh, that you have uh, looked at. I was wondering if you have directly worked with uh, local weavers uh, from the Philippines, no? Uh, and mm -hmm. then uh, also try to explore their techniques and uh, the materials no, used, even the meanings no, of all the uh, the woven fabrics that we have here in the Philippines. Because I'm mm -hmm. very intrigued with the, the, the stripe textile so this is actually from uh well that's very uh, prominent in um Visayas area the hablon hablon yeah <laughs> so it's like if you have uh you know um mentor or work with local weavers you now for more inspiration with your own um work in sculpture and weaving um i i don't have any from the philippines um and it's I'm I'm glad you caught that because I was actually trying to like reference Philippine textiles in that work in particular and like the crossing of that the the crisscrossing was actually really inspired by hablon designs and um I think like I don't always mention it because no one really knows at least like to some of the people that I talk to or show this work to and I remember one time my aunt I showed her and uh some of my weaving works and she was like oh you're it's like a Mexican blanket <laughs> and it's just like the context you read it in different you know in different contexts or kind of like how you experience these colors and these designs which I'm okay with um but the I mean i you know, there was a time when I, when I was in this period of being, you know, like really connecting like my textile and weaving practice to like the Philippines and like my Filipino heritage. And because there's like such a strong tradition in it, I really felt like I was kind of continuing that sort of legacy of, of craft, of textiles, of weaving. And I really, there was that time where like, I really wanted to um, you know, I dreamt of like having a mentor, having like a master weaver, um, and she was probably going to be a dream weaver and she would like, you know, dream designs and we would like collaborate together, like really like colorful, like, um, like dreams, like <laughs> ideas like that. And I think like, I, I feel that it's really important for me to, um, to work with the, with the people around me. Like, I think looking back at, the community arts work that I did and like Cynthia who is a weaver who's Filipino I mean I think that there's something inherently in in Filipino weavers that um that I I'm I'm interested in in like working with in um exploring with and um I feel like there's yeah like I I would love to work with a um with a master weaver from the Philippines. But I I think there's also just so much happening here in like the the sort of like diaspora context and kind of like exchanging those those ideas and trying to like um you know 
work with our context. I don't know, I don't know how to say this. I mean, like I, again, like I really, I would really, I would really love that. Like if there was an opportunity to like, yes, I would definitely like work with a master weaver from the Philippines, especially, but um, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of going with, uh, with the people around me who I, I feel like I can like learn so much from right now. Of course, you can always come here at Cordy Tech. No. You're most welcome <laughs> to explore our yeah. materials and also share uh, our research with you uh, regarding, um, the, of course, the materials used and others. Um, in the last uh, three to five years, there's a strong revival of Philippine handloom weaving. Um, of course, uh, there are initiatives from the communities and there's also in initiatives from different weaving uh, groups and also our government through the Philippine Textiles Research Institute. And mm -hmm. uh, you will see a lot of materials. But I'm just wondering, because you are in New York um, and of Toronto. course, uh, yeah, uh, Toronto. Um, I was wondering if you have looked at, for instance, aside from the materials that you have read and uh, made experiments on, have you looked at the uh, textiles uh, in different repositories in Toronto or in New York or uh, whatever? Um, I, I'm just wondering because you are there already, if in case. Hmm. You mean like, um, like textiles in museums or yeah. in other context textiles uh, in museums mm -hmm. yeah um yeah of course I was I was looking into that um I think I also wanted to touch up too like related to the path to the previous question like my experience when I so my first time going to the Philippines was actually pretty late in life I mean late say meaning like 25 24 25 or something and um I was already like exploring textiles and really invested in like Philippine textiles and like researching that. Um, and so when I went to the Philippines for the first time, it was the, we went to the mall, of course, when you're like, when you're like first time in the Philippines, you go to the mall and the Likang Habi like uh, event Habi was happening. So. Yeah. Um, and I was like, wow, it's all here. And I think like my exposure to that, I kind of, um saw more of like the economy the economic aspect of textiles and like the market and what's valued what's not valued um or sorry what's more valuable and what's not so so valuable and also of course again I went island hopping with my relatives and even when we went to those different workshops or I really like tried to pursue them um I like I like when we were in um, Palawan, we like tried looking for like a pinya workshop and, uh, you know, just things that were like very unique to the Philippines. And I I saw more of like, these are people who are, who are like working, who are trying to work and who are trying to make textiles and, and sell them. And it was a different um, sort of appreciation and respect that I, that I developed when I was there, when I saw it firsthand. And so when I do go to museums and when I do think of these weaving and when I do think of like how these things are made, I, I think about, you know, these, the weavers who are weaving it, they, they're like, they're, they're so talented. They're so skilled. They're so, you know, they have all of these things that like, I wish that I had. And, um, but you know, the way that they see the work that they're doing, it's, it's very different than the way I am, like as an artist making art or trying to make art. <laughs> so um, yeah, I I do, yeah, again, like when I, when I am doing my own sort of um, research, going to, to places and seeing like Philippine textiles, I, I also think about, you know, just this dynamic um, of like the, the very skilled weavers who are doing this and then the markets, or the market that, that these materials are a part of. Oh, you're muted again. There's a nice uh, Philippine collection at your doorstep at the Textile Museum of Canada in Rome. So this could be a very good resource, no, at the at your doorstep, maybe in Canada. Yeah. You might want yeah. to. Explore. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, 
that your talk is very inspiring, no? So I'm sure um some of our students who will be uh, watching this will be inspired by this uh, exploration of new materials and techniques, no? Um, uh, are you thinking of other mediums where you can integrate weaving yeah, aside from sculpture and other media? Um, not so much actually. I maybe maybe screen printing or printing um but i really you know i just really like weaving i just i also um i like i like the textures i like the different materials i i don't see myself or like i don't see like any future projects or even like ideas even like a little inkling of it that is tied to other media like i can't see like um weaving and video or like weaving and um any or performance or anything else i mean like i guess in a way you could say a lot of things are performance but um i really i mean i i think that i really approached my work through the lens of of someone who thinks very deeply about the meaning of materials and and form um and and um like sculpture does so much of that for me like especially through mold making through casting um and i yeah i am i think i mentioned this yeah that weaving and textiles and like working with these different fibers allows me to do that too and i think that there's there's just always so much more to learn so i'm i'm not like i'm not there in terms of like mixing it with other media i I'm really like focused on textile weaving um, and playing with different materials and the creating different narratives that can emerge from that. And also there's a lot I find that I learned simply from working with these materials that um, I, I feel like I can only, I don't know, like that I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm also not, I'm not saying no to, to the possibilities of you know of working with incorporating other media but just at the moment i'm i'm just really invested in in fiber okay thank you so much tim uh of course we have a, a fine arts program at the university of the philippines baguio and of course there are there are a lot of aspiring uh, visual artists now we have sculpture and others what advice can you make uh in order to encourage them not to look at weaving as a form of sculpture as a form of practice um i think i would say to um explore outside of your of what's around you or just because i found that for me i was always very like you know local <laughs> um i always just kind of like stuck to um the whatever opportunities was around me and that really shaped my perspective on art and when I um, studied abroad and I know not everyone has access to things like that when I started to look outside of like where I was in Toronto um, like the the possibilities and the different approaches and the different forms that I was exposed to really saw made me see like these these new ways of thinking and to really like innovate like for myself like how I approached my work so my advice would be to um, look outside look outside like you know physically and also just metaphorically too like think outside of the box um, if you if there's something that feels too common or something that you are work that you're 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 creating feels like you've sort of like seen it already then do something else. Like always think otherwise. That's what I would say. Um, and textiles, you know, like there's there's so many, I mean, th this is how I think like with sculpture and you could think the same with, with textiles and fiber. I mean, I do that on, like I've, I've found ways for myself to do that, to kind of like apply the way I approach my sculpture practice into my textile and weaving practice. Um, just simply by the way I work with the materials and how I think about the materials. So um, with however you have your 
however you approach your art practice to just always be thinking differently to to never never conform uh and you know you know sometimes we have to conform to survive <laughs> as artists but um always like think as much as you can to think differently yeah Good team. I was about to end, but there's two more questions from Diwa Malaya from University. Oh, hi, Diwa. <laughs> Why? Hello, Diwa. Okay, so let's um, accommodate the question first. How does weaving affected your own personal journey as Filipino in the diaspora? And what are your future plans, especially with the fellowship, uh, with the fellowship researcher with CAD SR? Yeah, Diwa is also a researcher at CAD SR, actually. Thanks for coming, Diwa. Um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> How does weaving affected your own personal journey as Filipino in the diaspora? And what are your future plans, especially with your fellowship researcher with CAD CR? Um, yeah, so I kind of like went over that um a bit earlier in my in my presentation, the way that like I I guess like what I'll say to that is I started weaving not really thinking about how it connects to um my Filipino culture or heritage or identity um but when I got involved with more of the community arts organizations um I I saw how this dynamic of like being in the diaspora and coming from um like my parents came in, coming from the philippines how how my how i was able to bridge my my interest in art and my art practice to um my my cultural identity um being filipino um in in ways that really um gave my practice more meaning um so that was kind of how weaving kind of connected me to this this uh awareness of of my identity and being part of the diaspora um and with CADSR like actually we've we've talked about this um I I think with Philippine textiles there's there's it's funny how um with so CADSR or the after school program that we're in it's a lot related to knowledge and um, uh, de-schooling, um, the production of, of knowledge and the distributing of it through this like de-schooling context of like not abiding by the institutional standards or expectations um, and kind of, you know, exploring that. And I feel like looking at, uh, I mean, when we, as we were going, as we go through this program, it. I find myself kind of going back to Philippine textiles, um, especially with Tanala and the Dreamweavers and um, the way that knowledge is preserved through textiles. Dreams are like so ephemeral and so passing and also the way that you can't really like always narrow down the exact images or experiences that you have, but the way that the Dreamweavers have been doing that through Tanala I feel like that's really interesting for me, especially in terms of like ways of of preserving um, or archiving knowledge. Um, so, yeah, and there's yeah, there's very interesting things that um, have that are that are practiced in in textiles. I think all over the world, but as someone who was who really like did a lot of research um, personally on Philippine textiles on my own. To what I had available, um, the way that um, the designs and the skills are passed down, and how this knowledge is passed down, but also thinking about like how the specific designs um, and where they come from as pieces of knowledge, how that really makes you think a lot about ways that people um, preserve 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 knowledge and share it, produce and distribute knowledge through textiles that's uh that's something that i've been thinking about in as a researcher in this in this program specific program yeah how fascinating uh tim no so uh i think we we shall end in a in a few minutes because we had okay 
for time already. So any last words to our participants and our students who will view this uh, later in the afternoon as well? Um, thank you for coming, <laughs> for listening to my talk. Um, yeah, I think also thank you to people who have been reaching out to me in a way. Like I, I've been getting, like since this came out, I've been getting new followers. And I really look at all of those followers and especially the ones that I that are finding out about this through Cordy Text and who are in the Philippines and and seeing other textile artists who are from the Philippines who I would never have encountered or known about had it not been through this, that they they started following me and I would follow them back. And I'm I'm really paying attention to that. And it's been really great. I think also um what I mentioned before, like there was so few resources that I had. Um, in terms of Philippine textiles, like when I first started weaving. And um, it's been so great now that there's all of these things happening. And I'm so excited to see where it goes next. I mean, I think, um, yeah, like, I, I hope, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if this is appropriate, but like, I hope you get more funding. I hope like, there's just endless oh, yeah. funding for, for this, for these projects Keep and funding. these initiatives. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need also funding. And of course, we have a, a very good research team also. It's interdisciplinary and a little office and a, lo a digital loom. We have workshops as well. So, oh, um, nice. and of course, uh, people like you who support Cordy Text, that is very much appreciated um, as well. Okay, so thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I haven't okay, seen you, you since 2012, was it? Long time ago. So yeah. I'm I'm very <laughs> more than work. more than ten years ago. <laughs> a decade, more than a decade. Yeah. So thank you so much, team. Um. Uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we're really pleased to see your work. I hope this will inspire younger artists, especially uh, looking at weaving as a medium or as, as a technique, no, uh, for uh, for their craft, no, and arts as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in our uh, webinar uh, series of Corditex Talks. Next month, we will have um, a special guest uh, who will talk about Bagobo uh, Textile. So do watch uh, our next month's edition on Corditex uh, Talks. Thank you so much, team, and thank you to our participants. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.